Welcome back, Fanfield family. Today I'm going to talk about my honest thoughts about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, what I loved, and what I really could have done without. I'll break the video down by sections. I finished Final Fantasy VII Rebirth on April 23rd, and I logged a total of 144 hours and 13 minutes on my first playthrough. It should go without saying that this video will contain spoilers for Rebirth, as well as potentially for Remake. First up, the characters. What did I enjoy, and what did I not? Let's start with Cloud. I really like the way Cloud gradually becomes warmer and warmer, more empathetic as he travels with the team. In Remake, especially early on, he still had that cold, ex-soldier facade, feigning complete disinterest in everything but the mission, but he's really starting to open up and show that he cares. We see this a lot in the idle dialogue when the party is running around the overworld and in the Escape from Junon section, where you can actually heal the troopers under your command to keep them safe. The way that Cloud talks to them at the end there is really sweet. He genuinely cares about the men under his command, even if they are, in some ways, the enemy. The fact is, we would have never won that commendation if you hadn't brought us all together. I might be out of line for saying this since we only just met, but the Seventh feels more like a family than ever, and we hope you feel the same. You're not out of line. It's been an honor, Trooper. But you're right. It's time you guys went your way, and I went mine. Will we see each other again, sir? <laughs> Count on it. <laughs> I love how they've redesigned many of Cloud's classic weapons to look more modern and befitting his subtle strength, while also adding some really elegant design elements. Sure, the Buster Sword is more function over form, but almost all of Cloud's other weapons are ornate, and they look like they could serve as ceremonial pieces, but are also functional. The Rune Blade is a great example, which existed in the original, but is now a lot more detailed. My favorite out of the bunch is probably the Umbral Blade, which I think is a redesign of the Force Stealer from the original game. I love the contrast of the dark steel and the glowing purple core. The Igneous Saber is also really cool. It almost looks like something out of Monster Hunter. I like Cloud's new abilities. I never really used Punisher mode in Remake, but with the Prime mode ability gained from the Umbral Blade, I find that's my usual stance, focusing on a barrage to build the ATB gauge, and then use Braver while in midair so the attack hits harder. The only thing I'm really not a fan of with Cloud is that sort of emotionless state he enters when under Sephiroth's thrall. We saw bits of it in the original, but not to this degree, and I get it, Sephiroth is portrayed as more powerful and influential here, so it makes sense, but it really feels like it subverts that more gentle and outgoing personality that Cloud has been developing. Moving on to Barrett, I really like how they're further developing his personality. We see that a lot of his anger is actually directed at himself for his failure to save his town from Shinra, and his willingness to accept the reactor that ultimately ended up being the reason everyone he cared about was wiped out. Tying into that, I really like his interactions with Dine in the Corel prison under the Gold Saucer. The original was sad, but this is just really emotionally crushing. Barrett thought he lost his best friend and finds out that Dine is still alive, then Dine attacks him, only for Dine to then sacrifice himself to save Barrett from Shinra. Even after all that time, all that built-up hate, Dine still cared about Barrett enough to give his life to protect him.
I missed you. I love how much Barrett seems to care for his friends. The most notable example, at least for me, is when Barrett sees that Sephiroth has killed Aerith. His immediate reaction is to shout, <coughs> and throw self-preservation to the winds to attack Sephiroth. It really speaks to his character. He's already lost so much. His wife, his town, his best friend, his teammates Jesse, Wedge, and Biggs, and now Aerith. Barrett has shouldered a lot of pain, but he hasn't become desensitized to it. I also really liked how you can synergize Barrett's abilities to do insane amounts of damage. ATB boost into bonus round, then overcharge, then maximum fury, all in rapid succession can absolutely decimate an enemy force. The only problem I have with Barrett is really just a nitpick. You don't get access to his Dragon King armor seen in the Loveless play. Moving on to Tifa, I really like how the game focuses on her past relationship with Cloud in flashbacks, in their conversations, and especially in her ride through the life stream inside one of the weapons. I love Tifa's Divine Punishment synergy ability with Aerith. It's very cool to look at, and it really feels like an ability the two would work out together. Aerith's barrier creating a perfect environment for Tifa to just bounce around in, hitting the target over and over. It gives me vibes of Rock Lee versus Gara in Naruto, with Lee using the eight gates to just shoot around the room so fast that Gara can't keep up. My biggest problem with Tifa is that she felt a lot weaker this time around. In Remake, I could basically main her even in boss battles, just boosting her up to Chi level 2 with unbridled strength, and then spamming Star Shower, but it feels like they've handicapped her a bit, so I mostly ended up using her as support or when Cloud and Aerith are both down or bound. Really, this is a huge failing. Tifa is supposed to be strong. She's supposed to be a martial arts master that can punch through pretty much anything in her way. Okay, on to Aerith. Aerith was pretty decent in the remake, but in Rebirth, she's the shining star. She's an incredibly powerful fighter with some of her support abilities. My general strategy was Radiant Ward to boost her attack power, then Arcane Ward to allow any spells cast in the area to be cast twice, then hitting the enemy with whatever elemental spell they're weakest to. It wasn't uncommon for Aerith to deal close to 20,000 damage to a single target that way. Aerith is much more than a simple healer now, which is awesome. In the original game, she didn't really have much viability as a direct attacker because her weapons were classified as physical damage, which was one of Aerith's weak points. Making her basic attacks magical gives her a lot more utility. Aerith was in my party through my entire playthrough, excluding sections where the game chooses your party, and I was able to get the date with her which was what I was going for. Speaking of the date, it was such a step up over the original. Aerith's voice actress did an amazing job bringing one of my favorite fictional characters ever to life. One thing I didn't like was the whole Aerith's dream thing. I feel that it caused problems with the flow of the game, just sticking segments with Zack in here and there. I get the importance of it. It's potentially setting up a way for Aerith to come back by using that world between worlds place to either stop Sephiroth entirely or pull Aerith over from a doomed timeline, but I feel like it could have been added in a more elegant way. Speaking of that, and I'll get into this a bit more later, but I did really like Cloud and Zack fighting together in the final boss fight. Okay, let's talk about Red 13. First, the positives. I love how they've expanded him beyond just a guardian of Cosmo Canyon. The split voice thing is absolutely adorable, putting on the deep, serious voice so he'd be taken seriously, and gradually getting more comfortable with the party so he starts using his natural voice more and more often. His voice actor really showed a ton of range in both of Nanaki's voices, and it's one of the coolest things about the character. I am that which you see before you. Nothing more. <sighs> hey, guys! It's me! Come back! Nanaki? I can't believe it! It really is you! <laughs> we were so worried! I also love how much more they've developed his backstory and how expanded the Gi Caverns were, as well as his ability to run on certain walls. That's always really cool. Now for the negative. 
Don't get me wrong, I love Nanaki as a character, but he feels kind of underdeveloped here in terms of combat, at least for the way I play. Because of that, I never really used him all that much, just really whenever it was mandatory for the story or the various training arenas that required his presence. And even then, I usually just let him do his own thing and control the other characters. Yuffie is... Uh, well, I have mixed feelings about Yuffie. She's definitely a lot of fun. She's fast, her ranged elemental ninjutsu is so cool, and some of her weapons are my favorites in the game. The Twin Viper is awesome visually. She's a lot of fun to have around and is solely responsible for some of the funniest moments in the story, like her iconic I'm Bored song. I am so, so bored, bored right out of my brain. If I don't die first, that y'all go insane. Cause I've got nothing else to do. I'm stuck, you're wasting time. But just wait, oh materia, I'll get back on the road and make you mine. That said, she feels noticeably weaker in Rebirth than she did in Intermission. Like, her attacks don't do as much damage, her gauges don't fill up as fast, and she goes down faster. In Intermission, I loved just being able to blitz entire groups of enemies in seconds with the right build with her, and I didn't really find that kind of an opening for Yuffie in Rebirth. I unfortunately have very little to say about Kate Sith that's positive. I love the accent, and it was neat that they made just the cat part capable of walking around instead of the giant Mog lumbering around everywhere. And that's where the positives end for me. I never really used Kate Sith much in the original game, and that trend continued here. The only real use I got out of him was by using his basic attack held down to quickly stun lock some enemies and to stagger. I do also like his bit of redemption, but it still feels kind of hollow. He betrayed the party, and sacrificing one body out of an entire production line doesn't seem like as big a sacrifice as the party makes it out to be. It feels so good to do good! Alright lads, enjoy your stay! Finally, I'll talk about Sid and Vincent together, because they're not playable, but are still significant in the story. I really loved Vincent. That deep bass voice really suits him, and his redesign for Rebirth is amazing. But he told the Turks, whose chopper I should be able to track. Really? I know which radio frequencies they use. The moment they get on comms, I'll find them. Be quiet. Listen. I feel it below us. <laughs> Scared. Of course you were. Wait. You're going to need my key card. It'll grant you access to the lower levels. I also had a ton of fun with his boss fight. I never really used Vincent much in the original, but he looks and sounds amazing now, and I'm actually looking forward to playing as him in part 3. Sid was toned down a little. He doesn't seem to swear nearly as much, and he doesn't smoke at all, which was not only part of his character in the original, but part of his dynamite limit break. That said, he's still a fun character, and I've grown to enjoy his new accent. I still have no idea why they changed it, but I'm okay with it now. Where to, folks? Cosmo Canyon, please. Uh, you talk? What the hell kind of magic trick is this? <clears throat> uh, not that I ain't seen crazier shit on my travels. My problem with both Vincent and Sid is, of course, that they're not playable. I get it. Coding an entire character's gameplay is time-consuming, much more so in the modern era with all the various animations and everything, but it would have been really nice to have the entire party together. With Aerith's death, we almost certainly won't be able to have Aerith and Sid in the same party, or Aerith and Vincent, and I think they would have had some really fun synergy abilities, like maybe Sid throwing a grenade and Aerith locking enemies into the blast radius with a barrier similar to the one she uses with Tifa for divine punishment. Of course, we have to discuss Sephiroth. I love how they've made him so menacing. Sure, he was an omnipresent threat in the original, always looming over the party, but he really feels foreboding now, especially with his free flight, that suave bass voice, and just the way he moves. The ability to play as him, fully control him, and even use his Limit Break Octo Slash in the Calm Flashback was also really great, and the expansion on what happened at Nibelheim is really powerful. It really shows you how he went mad and why. I loved how the final boss was not just a callback to Bizarro Sephiroth, but really a reimagining of it, splitting the party and swapping between them, throwing Zack into the mix, and even having Aerith fight briefly. Sephiroth Reborn really captured that unsettling eldritch appearance of Bizarro Sephiroth, but with the massively improved graphics, he looks even more horrifying, with glowing white pupilless eyes, the veins pulsing all over his body. It just works for me. 
And then you fight Sephiroth himself with Cloud, Zack, and Aerith. Just a really cool fight. Okay, I'd like to close out the characters section by talking about some of the minor characters quickly. Rufus was tough but fun to fight, and the Turks were a real highlight. Getting to fight Song was really cool. I loved Cisne. She's got an amazing theme song, which I'll discuss a little bit later when we talk about the music. Roche is one of those characters that I found kind of annoying the first time I played Remake, but he really grew on me, and I'm kind of sad about his ultimate end. The 7th Infantry Troops and Commander were really cool. They're basically just a side joke in the original, but they feel much more real now, like real people. Yuffie's crew from Intermission was neat to see again, of course, and hearing more about Wedge from them was sad. Wedge was a good man. Scarlet, Heidegger, Palmer, and Hojo were virtually unchanged from Remake and Intermission. Dio? It was I, Dio! No, thankfully not you. Nobody likes you. Get out of here. Dio was a pleasant surprise. He doesn't really have too much of a personality in the original beyond owner of the gold saucer, and giving him this overhaul was great. Chadley was a bit more endearing this time around, and Mai was a fun little addition. Okay, on to the story and the world. Come on, go! Come on get out of here. I don't even watch JoJo. How do you keep getting in here? I really like that they stick fairly closely to the original story while adding in new twists and turns here and there. One thing I found really neat was that the whole party is with you through most of the game, so you get all of those character interactions all the time. I did like how they really made it feel like a world, not just a blank landscape dotted here and there by towns, but honestly, I think they went a little too far with that. The sheer number of world intel locations, shrines, life stream springs, and so on was a little bit much, and I feel like it slightly slowed things down. I did like that the party was able to interact with people and help them out, that's always cool, but it got a bit out of hand. The example that comes to mind is in Gungaga, meeting the woman that wrote children's books and Barrett getting really excited because he realizes she's the author of his daughter's favorite book. Barrett helping her out with getting inspired to write more, that was a nice little bit of world building, but every region has dozens of little things to do and it just feels like they got a bit carried away. On a neutral note, I'm not sure how I feel about the changes they made to the world's geography. I suppose it doesn't bother me, but I'm not exactly fond of it either. No Fort Condor, the Temple of the Ancients moved up north, all of that just feels a little bit like an odd design choice, especially since we're presumably going with the idea of a different timeline than the original game. It's just a different timeline, not a whole new world. It doesn't detract from the game, but it did get a raised eyebrow from me. It would have been nice to visit Wutai as well. Now we've got to talk about the negatives in the world. The minigames were... irritating. I did the first 10 or 15 chocobo races before I just got so frustrated with it that I decided to move on. The chocobo cup side story for Choco Billy is the one side quest I didn't finish. Then there was the piano minigame. Ooh, the piano minigame. I'm bad at rhythm games at the best of times, and requiring two sticks to be used independently for the songs just destroyed me. I'm pretty sure the best rating I ever got was a B rank on the one in Costa del Sol, the mandatory one. One minigame that I did enjoy, and I was really surprised by this, was Queen's Blood. I normally can't stand card game minigames. Pazak and Kodor was passable at best, and I wasn't a fan of Triple Triad in Final Fantasy VIII, just as two examples. I did really like Queen's Blood, though. I had a lot of fun building a deck that could handle anything thrown my way. Alright, on to one of the least discussed but most important parts of any RPG, the monsters. I loved what they did with the monsters, making them really look new. For example, compare the Materia Keeper in the original to its redesigned counterpart in Rebirth, the Materia Guardian. There's just so much attention to detail. Of course, we can't talk about a Final Fantasy game without discussing the music. I really liked what they did here, not just bringing back old music and updating it, but new music entirely. Some of the most impactful songs for me were Cisne's theme, Under the Apple Tree, playing now, as well as Vincent's theme, The Nightmare Begins, and also those chosen by the planet, which is one of Sephiroth's many themes. I enjoyed Zack's theme, The Price of Freedom, which is both sad and beautiful. Each of the individual character themes has really been stepped up, and I'm not ashamed to admit that Aerith's theme made me tear up a little bit. Anyone that's watched my videos on Final Fantasy VII knows that Aerith isn't just my favorite Final Fantasy character, but one of my favorite fictional characters ever. I knew it was coming at the end of Rebirth, and her theme really nails her character. It's beautiful and sad and hopeful and gentle all at once. I mean, just listen to this. Thank you.
The music of Final Fantasy VII inspired a generation of fans, and now that we have the remake trilogy, or at least two parts of it, an entire new generation of fans will learn to love this music. Take, for example, the song playing now, a metal cover of the battle version of Yuffie's theme Descendant of Shinobi by the ever-fantastic Ferd K, who has once again graciously allowed me to use this in one of my videos. Bird K is fantastic as ever, so I'll include a link to the video itself, to their channel, and if you haven't already, go check out my Tifa video where I included Bird K's cover of Tifa's theme. Thanks again for letting me include your awesome music. Now I'd like to talk about a few things that I liked that don't really fit anywhere else. The voice acting is really on point with everyone. You can hear in all the voices just how much they're enjoying working on a remake of one of the biggest cultural juggernauts in video game history. Next, the various outfits. I love that sort of thing in games, getting to change characters' appearance, and I think for the most part they nailed it here, and giving the characters multiple options is a nice touch. The various beachwear options are nice, they're fun alternatives without getting too over-sexualized, and they really feel like they fit each character's personality. I would have loved to see Aerith's red dress from Remake as an option, that thing was amazing. But I'm pretty happy with what we got. I had a decent bit of fun with the different regional chocobos, the different colors and abilities were really cool, but I think the Nebel region chocobo was my favorite with that water jet thing. Speaking of chocobos, I like how each character rides slightly differently. Nanaki has to perch in just the right way to ride, and Aerith rides side saddle because her dress would rip open if she tried to straddle the seat. The Fort Condor minigame to get the Proto Relic was just adorable, pulling Cloud, Barrett, and Tifa in and giving them polygonal bodies that are obvious references to their 1997 appearances. I have to mention the date, of course, which I touched on a bit earlier in the video, but just a bit more here. You guys know by now that I love Aerith. She's my favorite Final Fantasy character, and in my top three fictional characters ever, so I was really happy when I got her as Cloud's date. They took a relatively small section from the original and made it really feel like a date, a full-blown evening out together. Seeing Barrett and Tifa crying when the Gold Saucer gave tribute to Jesse was heart-wrenching, of course, but honestly, that's a good thing. Feeling that sort of thing means the game has done a good job of developing the characters. It means they're deep enough that you can empathize with them, share their struggles, successes, and failures. The trip on the sky wheel for the date is really sweet, and they stuck pretty close to the original script in that section, which I appreciated. Hurry up! Okay. So, shall we?
What do you think this does? Wow! This is incredible! Check it out! This is insane! Chocobo racing's nothing like that. Well, you would know! <laughs> You surprised me at first. You were just like him, and... It wasn't your face or your clothes. It was you. The way you walked. The way you carried yourself. Whenever I looked at you, I saw him. But you're not him. And that's okay. Because right now, I want to be with you. And I'm trying so hard to find you. But I'm right here. Yeah, you are. But... Just till the ride's over. Finally, I'd like to close out with a short discussion of a few theories and hopes I have for Part 3. First, one thing that I'm really hoping happens is that Aerith is brought back. We've seen that Sephiroth is able to travel between different timelines, so I definitely think it's possible that some multiverse shenanigans can bring her back. Aerith and Sephiroth both seem to be aware that there are multiple timelines, even as early as Remake, where Aerith tells Cloud, I'm glad I met you, Cloud. I really am. I'm grateful for all the words we've shared, for all the moments and the memories, you've made me more happy than you know. And I'll always cherish what you've given me. But... But whatever happens, you can't fall in love with me. Aerith seems to have some inkling that she wouldn't survive, and that, combined with the multiple timelines, implies it's possible that she could come back. Am I being overly optimistic? Am I just wishing against fate? Maybe. Maybe. I'm also really hoping that we get to actually fight Emerald and Ruby Weapon in Part 3. I love their designs in the original, and seeing them brought up to modern graphical levels would be amazing. The weapons are supposed to be huge, and due to the graphical limitations of 1997, we only really get that feeling of scope in the FMV cutscenes, but with modern tech, I can see them being really brought to life in their full scale. 
They could have Cloud and the party run or climb up Ruby Weapon's arms, fighting off swarms of smaller creatures that it creates or summons so they can attack the neck or eyes, that sort of thing. I'd also like to see an actual battle against Sapphire Weapon instead of it just getting its head blown off in a cutscene. Finally, I'd like to hear more about the Gi tribe. What we've learned so far is pretty intriguing, implying that they're not really from this plane of existence, that they come from somewhere else, and because of that they can't return to the livestream because they didn't come from it in the first place. Finding out more about that would be really interesting. My theory is that they're from the space between worlds, which would tie into the reason why the Black Materia can gain access to that space, because it's so intrinsically linked to the Gi, who come from that place, the void between worlds. So, how would I rate Final Fantasy VII Rebirth out of 10? Well, I'd give it an impressive 9.6 out of 10. It has a few things that I find are hang-ups, but like I said, the negatives are massively overshadowed by the positives. I'm already looking forward to my next playthrough, and I'm definitely looking forward to Part 3 when that materializes, probably 2027 or 2028. Fingers crossed that it's on the PS5. I really don't want to have to get another console just to play it. And that's it for Final Fantasy VII content, at least for the time being. I may return to it at some point, but for now, it's back to Star Wars. I've got a few ideas for videos, so the usual schedule is still on. Thank you so much for watching. I really enjoyed making these Final Fantasy VII videos. The original is one of my favorite games ever, and I think the remake games will be up there too, but I'm waiting to reserve judgment until I've played all of them. If you liked what you just watched, please consider leaving a comment, a like, and hitting that subscribe button. It really, really does help. Go check out my older videos too. I've got a lot of content on the channel, and a lot of it is neatly put together in playlists for your convenience. I'm looking forward to making more videos for all of you to watch, so I'll see you in the next one.